Welcome to, uh, to the library, uh, this, the Georgetown Library. We're, uh, this is a, a slow reopening. The main part of the library isn't open yet. It's just this brand new auditorium. Uh, so this is the first adult program here. There was a children's program earlier today. You're welcome to come to those as well, but they're fun. Um, but this is the first adult program, so you're helping to christen uh, this brand new auditorium. So thank you all for being here. Uh, and it's part of the Georgetown County Library 225th anniversary. Uh, so library services started in 1799 in Georgetown County. Uh, that's, you know, that was one year before the Library of Congress was founded. So it's a, a long history and uh, we're having a series of events uh, to celebrate that, that long history, 225 years. And uh, Zachary Vernon is here to, to kick it off. So we're, we're really proud and pleased to have him and honored uh, to have Zach uh, back here, coming back home uh, <clears throat> to, to really uh, get, us, get us going in the right direction. Uh, there is, there'll be a, a series of other presentations and there's a schedule back on that, that green covered table there. If you wanna just take a, click a picture with your, your cell phone, it's also available online at Georgetown County Library, uh, the Facebook page uh, and elsewhere. So uh, please come out again and see some of these other events continuing uh, through the summer and through the fall. Uh, we do ask, if you don't mind, uh, this, this event is sponsored by South Carolina Humanities. So we do have participant evaluations back there with some pins that I have pilfered from various uh, churches and other organizations uh, around the Waccamaw Neck, Georgetown County area. So if you don't mind taking a quick moment and filling out one of these vows and just turning it in right back there, that'd be great as well. Um, and uh, this is sponsored by South Carolina Humanities, so uh, we want to acknowledge them. This, this program and uh, this series uh, is sponsored by South Carolina Humanities. That's a not-for-profit organization inspiring, engaging, and enriching South Carolinians with programs on literature, history, culture, and heritage. South Carolina, South Carolina Humanities receives funding from the National Endowment for the Humanities, Democracy Demands Wisdom. Um, and we'll, we'll hear some wisdom, some wry wisdom uh, from uh, Dr. Zachary Vernon today. Uh, I'm, my name is uh, Dr. Daniel Cross-Turner. I'm head of programming and outreach for the Georgetown County Library. Uh, in a, a previous life career, I was a, uh, uh, a professor of English and my field was Southern Lit. Uh, and so that's where I first came across Zach Vernon, uh, Professor Vernon, who, uh, you know, I'm a, a little bit older than Zach, and he struck me immediately as one of the best, I, I'd say, of his generation, uh, but I think of any generation, he's one of the best uh, scholars of Southern literature or Southern culture uh, that, that there is around. He's, he really is a superstar He's established himself uh, in that realm as, as an absolute superstar, so uh, the best and the brightest. So he, he's done that, uh, been at the top of his discipline, uh, and then, you know, that's not enough for him. Now he's writing books, not, not uh, academic books. Now he's writing creative writing books. He's writing novels. So he's moving into another field, and it's no surprise that it's, we've got Ron Rash, the New York Times called Ron Rash the greatest writer in America a few years back. But Ron Rash uh, is giving him uh, a wonderful blurb uh, talking about uh, what a fine writer Zach Vernon is. So, and, and others like George Singleton. Um, poignant and comic, the, the words of praise for our bodies electric. Uh, so it is, you know, it's a, really an honor to have uh, Zach Vernon uh, back here. Dr. Vernon grew up right here in Pauley's Island, as some of you may know. So a native son, 
but definitely a local boy who's done very good out there. Uh, he's currently a, an associate professor of English up at, uh, up at Appalachian State University. So he's traded the sea for the mountains, the, the blue sea for the blue ridge uh, up there. But uh, we're very, very proud and pleased to have him come back uh, for a little bit and be with us today. Uh, and talk about Our Bodies Electric, which is uh, a, it's a young adult novel, but it, it, I think it has universal uh, resonance, not just for, for young adults. Um, Our Bodies Electric, hot off the press, uh, just came out, a novel that's a Southern coming of age story about a teenager named Josh, um, who will see the kind of conflicts that he has to negotiate and come through. But let's just uh, give, give a welcome back home to our, 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 uh, our local hero here, Zachary Vernon. Thank you so much, Dan. Um, and thanks, everybody, for coming. I know almost all of you here, which is great. Um, yeah, so it's a great honor to be able to come back here and talk about this, this book. Awesome. Well, we're thrilled to have you. And uh, you know, how about? Uh, if we start out with a, a little biographical question, um, what if you grew up here in, in Polly's, you live up in the mountains now, but you, you were, I guess, a kind of beach boy growing up, or at least grew up here. Uh, what impact did growing up here in Polly's Island have on you? Yeah, I mean, if we're talking about geography and ecology, um, I think it had a huge huge impact on me um, in very positive ways. Um, most of my academic work has been about the South, but a lot of it has been about environmental issues. Um, and I think my interest in those sorts of issues was definitely formed here. Um, as different as Boone and Polly's Island are, I think they're similar in certain ways in that you have the most extreme landscapes in the South represented in these two places, the mountains and the sea, um, both places that have historically have been, you know, sites that have been considered sublime to many people. Um, they're extreme geographies that I think elicit extreme responses from us. Um, I think it's sort of easy to not care about environments when they are less sublime. Um, and I think there's something about like, confronting the ocean and confronting the mountains that makes us feel our own insignificance. And I mean that in very positive ways, that we feel yeah. that humanity is not the center of things. And then from there, you make a sort of small jump to, well, if we aren't the center of things and we really value these sorts of landscapes, then maybe we should try to protect mm. them. Um, the other similarity is I think there's both polys and Boone, where I live now, are they're largely tourist economies. Um, and that tourist industry really revolves around um, the outdoors. Like, we don't come to either of those mm -hmm. places to go see operas or see great films um, or see bands necessarily. We go because the landscape is incredible in both of these places. Um, so I think they're similar in that way. Um, and, and I think people tend to value that experience outdoors more here as yeah. a result of that. Yeah, that's a wonderful, uh, wonderful insights, plural there, you know, great, great lead off hit. Um, you know, Ron Rash, are a, a, born in South Carolina, but very associated uh, with, for most of his life and career now with the North Carolina mountains, not, not far from you up in Boone. Uh, but uh, I remember him saying, uh, talking about looking out at the, you know, the rolling uh, Blue Ridge Mountains surrounding him, that they were almost like tombstones, you know, that they reminded him when he saw that of his own insignificance, as you said, his own kind of mortality and how, uh, how insignificant we were as an individual human and how grandiose the natural world is and how we need to, uh, need to protect that. Um, so that's very much consonant with, with what you just said. And we got the waves out here, those the, the ever rolling waves at the ocean here as well. That's a, uh, yeah, an incredible connection, I think you just, you just made. So 
Uh, very nice. And, and as a scholar, you, you, did, you published a wonderful book collection, one on Ron Rash, first of all, a uh, collection of essays, but also Echo Criticism and the Future of Southern Studies, which was a major you know, foundational study uh, in, in, in terms of Southern cultural and literary studies. So uh, he knows what he's talking about. Um, how about uh, growing up here in Polly's, um, any, any adventures? Uh, we, he did a movable feast earlier today, so some, uh, some minor adventures came out there, but anything uh, that, you, that you would talk about, that you would want to share, or, or that you know, the, the statute of limitations is, is no longer <laughs> applicable that you can share with us here? Uh, um, yeah. I think I was a weird, artsy kid who did some weird <laughs> things along and along. Um, yeah, I was remembering yesterday as I was like driving across uh, the South Causeway onto Polly's Island that I tried to live off the land briefly. <laughs> um, it, and yeah, it lasted like two days, and I think I only ate sea asparagus um, and failed to catch fish the whole time. Mm. Um, but we had lots of weird adventures like that. Again, like all, I think, sort of um, surrounding the natural world. Um, I was also remembering, um, just thinking about environmental issues, like I think going with my mom to see the loggerhead sea turtles hatch a couple times, mm. um, which was an amazing experience for my development, especially in terms of like thinking about the environment, because it's like instant gratification, which we don't get very often with environmental issues. Like the sea turtles emerge from the dunes, mm -hmm. they're trying to go toward the moon as it rises out of the ocean, and then they think the lights on the beach houses are the moon, they go the wrong direction, you get to go and you know literally redirect them into their proper element, um, which, Again, is that kind of instant gratification that we don't often get as environmentalists, where normally it's like, well, I got a gas efficient car, or I recycled, or I changed the light bulb in my house, and you're like, does that do anything <laughs> for the world? Yeah. Um, and I'm not sure that it does first, but also, like, it doesn't have that sort of instant result, that tangible thing that you can look at and say, like, I changed that sea turtle's life in this way. So yeah, that was something that I thought about like growing up a lot. Um, yeah, and I think there were a lot of, uh, turning to like people, there were a lot of people in this community that were really fascinating um, that I think impacted me a lot. Um, you know, we talked about Mary Jenny DeBose a lot yes. this morning, we can talk about her again, who was a very transformative teacher for me. Um, Linda, who owned the art gallery, which happened to be right next to my dad's office growing up and sort of like seeing that firsthand. Yeah. Um, uh, Dean and Kathy, <laughs> we were talking about earlier um, in the Mockingbird Cafe, um, I think was a really interesting space for me, um, especially in terms of like thinking more about art. Dean always had some weird mind-blowing thing to say to me. Um, I was talking earlier, Dean, about uh, you would write Henry Miller quotes on the wall <laughs> of the restaurant, which made me then go, get a copy of Henry Miller. And I remember in high school hiding sexus in my biology textbook and reading <laughs> um, Henry Miller uh, in class. Um, Cindy Lauper came in one day, remember that? Wow. <laughs> um, and we made Cindy Lauper a cheese danish and she said it was the best cheese danish she's ever had. <laughs> um, yeah, so there were all these sorts of like interesting, um, despite the fact that I think Polly's this, this small town, there were all these really interesting eccentric people, both who lived here and sort of who migrated through yeah. here that were really fascinating. Yeah, I, it's Cindy Lauper. Um, and it, you, I, I remember you telling me one time you, you ran into Mickey Spillane, the popular writer, uh, detective, hard-boiled detective writer who used to be on Miller Lite commercials and. In, in films, uh, Mike Hammer, author. Did, what, how did you run into him? He, Merle's Inlet resident, Mickey yeah. Spillane. This is, a, this is a dim memory, but I feel like <laughs> <laughs> my parents need to verify, because um, sometimes I think my memories are not 
100% accurate. Um, but as I remember, we were in Cub Scouts, so this was pretty early, and we were doing some kind of fundraiser at the Harris Teeter, and Mickey Spillane showed up to support the fundraiser, and then for reasons that I don't understand, I ended up in the car with him. Yeah. And I'm not sure if other boys did this, but like he had this 50s or 60s Cadillac convertible, and he offered to give me a ride, and then I just remember like tearing around sure. <laughs> Merle's Inlet yeah. with this man that I didn't know, and like, I mean, I read him more recently, but had no idea who he was at the time, so right. yeah. Um, but then found out that he was a writer later, and I think that was like also a sort of interesting development for me because, yeah, I mean, I think when you're a kid, you don't realize, like, even though you're really into music and film and books, it doesn't click until you realize, like, oh, that's a real person in the world who is making this art, yeah. um, that, like, somebody is responsible for that film or for that song. And so even though I didn't ever know <laughs> Mickey Spillane beyond this one um, car ride that might be a dream that I had one time, um, <laughs> that just knowing there was a writer in town, I think, was sort of inspirational mm -hmm. for me as a kid, yeah. who, who for some reason wanted to be a writer for reasons that I don't understand. Yeah. And you, and you know, you, you did, as I mentioned, you're, you're a scholar, very uh, highly regarded uh, scholar. Uh, what, what, how did you make this uh, transition over to the other side uh, that we typically think of it as an other side or the other side into creative writing, academic writing into creative writing. What, what sparked that transition? I mean, I think I always wanted to do creative writing. Um, I did creative writing in undergrad, and I wrote obsessively in undergrad. Like, it was all so bad. Um, but I wrote like, I mean, I wrote, I mean, I must have written a hundred stories and two novels in mm -hmm. undergrad alone. And then after undergrad, I really wanted an MFA, not a PhD. Mm. But I didn't know anything about academia and the fact that jobs are usually very hard to come by in academia. So I got a PhD because I thought that was like the practical choice. Yeah. So it was like a decade and a half and I didn't write anything from grad school to getting tenure, and then I got tenure, and I was like, all right, I'm gonna do what I wanna do now, and so I started yeah. writing fiction again, and it also happened to correspond with the beginning of the pandemic, which was so horrible in so many ways, but like one sort of good thing about the pandemic was I had so much more time to write. I was just at home and like was able to concentrate on this book for a year. Yeah, one of the one of the good things maybe to come out of the the pandemic was that time at home, at least for writers. Um, so that this this was birthed out of that. Our body selector, and and during your your graduate student career, you uh, you were taking academic courses, uh, but also you you ran across some great writers: Jill McCorkle, uh, Minrose Gwen, uh, Keith Lee Morris, Randall Keenan, the great uh, writer. Chapel Hill, so, so you did get, you know, you, you came across some real major figures as well. Yeah, and I studied with all those figures, I mean, who were huge in Southern Lit, um, but it was still always like in academic context yeah. and not creative writing context, so yeah, it took me a long time to sort of claw my way back to the creative side yeah. of things. And have you found that, do you find it more enjoyable to write uh, creatively than academically? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, I mean, academic writing is, it's just, it's a schlag, it's harder, it takes so much more research, and then at the end of it, no one reads it. <laughs> and so, yes. yeah, there's something that feels defeating about that. Um, so, yeah. yeah, and I don't know if anyone will read this, but like, it, it was more fun to write and hopefully also maybe yeah. has an audience. Yeah, that's, that's the idea. I think there, you know, he, Zach read, Chapter was it the first chapter? It was or the third, third section. Chapter. Yeah, uh, third chapter. Yeah, there are fifty-two chapters in yeah. this thing, so they're pithy, quick-hitting chapters. But it was, you know, I think there'll be an audience. It was a lot of fun. Uh, he read that at, at Linda Ketron's Movable Feast earlier today. Um, so it, it it was a lot of fun to listen to. So I I'm assuming it was a lot of fun uh, to write, more fun than a 
than maybe an yeah. academic article, <laughs> which tend to be kind of tortured, the language and, and all that. But um, so, yeah, so you, you've kind of converted over now um, uh, into, onto the, uh, the creative side. Um, so let, let's talk about this, this debut novel, Our Bodies, uh, Our Bodies Electric, which is on sale. Zach, uh, we asked him to bring some copies, uh, $20, uh, if you don't have a copy already. And, and it is uh, right off the press. Uh, you know, it, it came out, uh, what, the, what, what date? June 4th. June Officially. 4th. So, yeah, yeah it's, it's been out a week now. Uh, so just a few days ago, this thing came out, uh, and Our Bodies Electric, even the title, uh, Sizzles. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about this book, Zach? What yeah, yeah. Um, so it's about a adolescent guy named Josh um, and sort of a band of misfits that he's friends with. Um, who get up to all kinds of hijinks around Polly's Island. Um, and it sort of, it centers around the years sixth grade to ninth grade. Um, and I'm particularly interested in that period because that's the period where we start to understand that our bodies are not just like the things that move us from point A to point B, but like our bodies are like a fun house. <laughs> we never realized all the pleasures that it could bring us. Um, and so on the one hand, you're discovering that in these sort of natural and healthy ways. But in, on the other hand, a lot of society is telling you that what you're doing is wrong in these explorations, or at worst, that like you're going to go to hell because of these things that you're doing. Um, so that creates, I think, like a super storm of conflict in the minds of people who are 13, 14 years old, because you have the best experience you've ever had simultaneously is, according to certain authorities, uh, something that's really naughty and you shouldn't be doing. Um, so it, I think that moment of transition is really interesting. And I think it might be like the time in which we change the most as people from sixth to ninth grade. Like maybe the only time when we change more is like, going from an infant to a toddler. But sixth to ninth grade is like a seismic shift in our life where you're a kid in sixth grade. I mean, you're a baby. And then by ninth grade, you're full of raging hormones and thinking very adult thoughts mm -hmm. and wanting to do very adult things. Yeah. Um, so I thought that was sort of the perfect moment to sort of think about these bigger questions of how we understand our bodies, but also how we understand our identities, our genders, our sexualities, yeah. as we become adults in the world. Yeah. And could you, could you just say a little something about the title itself and you know, what, what the, the reference there and what, that, what the meaning is? So the title is a riff on the famous Walt Whitman poem, I Sing the Body Electric. Mm -hmm. um, and I made it a sort of collective bodies in this title. Um, but Walt Whitman is the writer that I'm most obsessed with and have been most obsessed with since high school. Um, Walt Whitman, for I'm sure you all know, but um, poet in the 19th century, um, really wrote and rewrote one book for his entire life for a period of 40 years, um, Leaves of Grass. Um, and in Leaves of Grass, there are all these great poems, I Sing the Body Electric, Song of Myself, in particular, is the one that I was sort of also riffing on here a lot. But Whitman was introduced to me by Mary Jenny DeBose, my high school English teacher. And it was a complete revelation for me. Um, because Whitman is this poet that gives you permission to be yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and, then, and then after giving you permission to be yourself, says, you actually never even needed permission <laughs> to, to begin with. Um, so yeah, so a lot of the book is sort of about Whitman. Um, so I started the book when I was turning 37 years old. And in the end of the first section of Song of Myself, 
Whitman says, I, now 37 years old, in perfect health, begin hoping to cease not till death. Hmm. Um, so he's, he's 37 when he writes this great epic poem. Um, I think the greatest epic poem in American history. So I was turning 37. I was um, getting tenure. And I was pivoting toward creative stuff. And I thought, I should read Whitman every day for my 37th year on the planet. And I did. So I read Whitman for 365 days straight. Every single day, did not miss a single day. Sometimes just reading a few lines, sometimes really you know, diving in deep. Um, so Whitman, in terms of form and content, was really the obsession while writing this book. So in terms of um, content, all the ideas about sort of individual liberation and celebrating yourself and authenticity of self. And then in terms of form, the book is prose and Whitman's poetry, but Whitman's Song of Myself is broken up into 52 sections. And this book is broken up into 52 mm -hmm. sections. So each section of the book is sort of in dialogue with a section of Whitman. So that's a very nerdy <laughs> thing that you don't necessarily need to know about when you're reading the book. Um, I think you can read it just fine without Whitman, but there is this other sort of Whitman obsession that's kind of hovering in the background. And, and the kid is also reading Whitman in the book, and Whitman becomes a kind of life coach in his imagination as he's um, going through puberty. Yeah, and, and there are the, the chapters, even though they connect with Whitman, they're you know, titles like Skid Marks and Codpiece, so it's not a little... <laughs> Looser. Oh, Whitman was pretty loose, but you know, not yeah. quite that loose. A little funnier, a little more humor involved in our bodies electric. Um, so, but that kind of Whitmanian, you know, love of life and embrace of, of diversity and uh, exper wide experience uh, is comes through in this. And you mentioned I never got to meet Mary Jenny Debose, but she seems like a quite a character in her own right. Yeah. Um, who knows or knew Mary Janie DeBose? You did. I know y'all did. Um, Mary Janie DeBose was my high school English teacher. The book is, is dedicated to her. I write um, for my high school English teacher, Mary Janie DeBose, who gave us Whitman and taught the outcasts of Polly's Island to celebrate ourselves. Um, yeah, so I mean, Miss De DeBose was the most transformative teacher I ever had, like, even though. I went on to get a BA and an MA and a PhD. Um, she, I think, changed my life the most. Um, and, and I think she did for a lot of people. I mean, we were yeah. at the reading earlier today, and um, there were several people there who, well, there were a lot of people there who knew her, but there were a few people that actually had taken classes with her. And so I think she touched a lot of lives um, mm -hmm. at the risk of sounding cliche or like, the Dead Poet Society. Um, she, I mean, she expanded the way that we thought about the world. Um, you know, we were sort of exposed to certain ideas and ways of thinking about the world, and then she really just exploded that and made us realize that there's a great big world out there. Um, which is not to suggest that there's anything, you know, wrong or limiting about the way you know our families or communities were seeing the world. But she was just like literature is this window to all these other people and all these other times, I mean, throughout you know, the vast majority of human history. Um, so yeah, I think she gave us literature. That was one thing. Um, but she also created a space in the classroom that I think was different from anything I ever experienced in any other classes through high school, um, which is that she, I mean, I think she was brilliant. I think she was very rebellious herself. I think she was very subversive herself. Um, but she created a space in the classroom where it was like a true free exchange of ideas. No holds barred. Um, not in any sort of inappropriate, <laughs> untoward way. But we could talk about anything. Um, and, and we did it with maturity and respect, I think. But um, yeah, really like no topics were off the table, mm -hmm. which was not something we'd ever experienced with most teachers, and I understand that, you know, most teachers are in public school worried about losing their job for going in certain places. Sure. And she just was, she had no fear. Mm. And so, yeah, she ended up being the sort of authority figure for us 
without ever trying to be an authority figure. Like ironically, she gained our authority because we just ended up respecting her so much for her lack of rules <laughs> in the classroom. So yeah, she was an extraordinary woman. Um, and yeah, I was very sad to learn. I mean, I had not kept up with her and I was very sad to learn that she passed away in mm. 2021. Um, and so, um, yeah, I was a little bit nervous about like, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a naughty book in certain ways. So, you know, I was a little bit trepidatious to think, you know, what would she think about this? What's her family going to think about this? Um, but yeah, I was yeah. talking earlier today about her daughter is apparently like thrilled oh, <laughs> about the fact wonderful. that it's dedicated to her. Um, so yeah. yeah, and I think most of us would be too. I think she would get a kick out of it. Yeah. Um, yeah, she sounds like a wonderful, wonderful person. And, and, and you know, sometimes it's a, as a teacher, as you know, you kind of, it's like the parable of the sower. Uh, you just sort of, you're throwing a lot of seeds out there and you don't know, you don't always get the feedback. You don't know, you know, those seeds might really be falling on fertile soil and like they did with you and, and many others. And, you know, look, look what you've done and you, this is what you've grown growing back and, and you're teaching others and inspiring them at, at Appalachian State and elsewhere. So, um, so I'm sure she's very, you know, very proud of you. Um, and so, you know, that, that kind of brings us to another line of, I guess, a line of questioning, but the, you know, fact and fiction. Um, this is, you, why did you decide to set this book in Polly's Island? Um, you could, I mean, you could have made up a place, but it, why, why set it in, in Polly's here? And, you know, you, Waccamaw Elementary School, and, you know, you're, you're using the real setting, the real place. Mm. Yeah, I mean, the most obvious answer is that I grew up here, and so it's what I know, yeah. and it's, I went through those formative years here, and so it, it is the backdrop of that experience, and I'm obviously drawing on a lot of personal experiences in that character. Um, but I also like, I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of Eudora Welty, mm -hmm. um, great Southern writer, Eudora Welty. Um, and she has this amazing essay where she talks about how if you drill down deep enough in any particular place, you reach the universal. So on one level, the book is set in Polly's Island because it's what I knew. On another level, I think, you know, none of the issues that are brought up in the book are unique to Polly's Island, and I hope there's something more mm. universal about the topics that are being discussed and about that moment of adolescence that I'm really talking about here. Yeah. Um, but I also think there's, there's a certain, like, faithfulness to reality that is necessary as you're, like, drilling down into a place to get to the universal. Whereas if it was, like, Bob's Island, and it was, it, yeah. I don't think it would have the same kind of resonance if it was fully fictionalized in that way. It keeps it real, it keeps it honest in a way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, kind of drawing off of that, how, how did you negotiate kind of drawing from real people and, and institutions here in Polly's uh, in, into your book? How did you, how did you kind of negotiate that, that task? Yeah. And, I mean, I think there's a lot of me in it, obviously, in the yeah. main character. Um, but other than the Josh character who's based on me, none of the characters are really based on real people. You okay. Know? Like, I mean, my parents are not the parents that are in the book. Um, the parents in the book are much crueler than, crueler than my actual parents. Um, the friends that, are, uh, that Josh has in the book are uh, not based on any particular friend. I mean, if anything, they're like, Fictionalize, or they're a composite of about mm -hmm. like 12 boys that I knew growing up that we got into trouble, that I got yeah. into trouble with. Um, so, yeah, so I think like if anybody's gonna be embarrassed, hopefully it's only me. Because <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I'm the only like one who's like is very clearly present in the book. Um, and the other thing is like, I, I I don't think it's a mean-spirited book. I don't think it's a tragic story. I think it's hopefully a funny book, um, and hopefully a book that is ultimately about celebrating life and accepting difference, um, and is not 
a terrible representation of this place. Mm. Um, and instead is like, you know, there are issues that exist here that also exist everywhere, and I'm happy to be exploring them relative to this place. Um, but I'm certainly not making fun of Polly's Island in any way. Um, you know, the characters don't have to leave to find themselves. I think that's really important to keep in mind. So, I mean, there are problematic things about the community, but also, like, the characters find a form of salvation in the community, right? They don't have to leave. It's not like one of those tragic stories where it's like you kill yourself or you go to New York City. It's like there are people like Miss DeBose and all sorts of other quirky local characters who help the kids along the way. So yeah, so the place has the problems, yeah. but the place also has the solutions. And so I hope that that's not interpreted in a way that certain, you know, sort of tragic Southern Gothic stories are always like end in suicide or yes. murder or leaving the South to go to Boston or New York. Yes. So it's not that kind of story, in other yeah. words. OK, yeah. Um, and so, you know, I was going to ask you if you were worried about offending anyone or the community here, you know, with this book. Because uh, it, it does have some wit, you know, some sharp edge wit. but. Um, but it sounds like you, you, you should only be concerned about offending yourself because it's Josh <laughs> is the character you're kind of making fun of yourself. But are, I mean, were you concerned about, or are you concerned about offending people here, or was that? Um, is that yeah, something? totally. I mean, yeah. I mean, I, I hope if someone read the book that they would not be offended because mm -hmm. again, it is this sort of celebration of difference in life. Yeah. I think people could like be anxious about being offended if they didn't take the time to read the book or read it with an open mind. Um, I mean, I guess somebody could be offended if, you know, a very religious person I could imagine being offended, for instance, if they're homophobic. I mean, the book explores gender and sexuality in a way that, you know, it's about some characters um, end up being straight, some characters end up being gay, some characters have a sort of gender fluidity that I think could make certain people mm. uncomfortable, but, but I'm not really writing the book f for those people anyway. Yeah. Um, so I don't, think, I don't think they would read the book. I said earlier, like, I, don't, <laughs> I think they would only read the book to ban the book, and I've heard studies that say banning books is like the best possible way to sell books these <laughs> days, so, so yeah. yeah. Maybe we'll, we'll have the library here, your hometown library ban it. Yeah, we'll that would, that would announce, a, <laughs> announce a campaign to ban this so that'll book sales through the, through the roof, the hometown. Yeah, um, I, t I, I, write, I started to write some, like you, sort of switched over from academic writing to creative writing, which I find much more uh, internally rewarding. And I read about uh, some family stuff, uh, but I, I wait till the people die before I you know, write about them. That's another, another strategy so they can't be offended, at least not in this world anymore. Um, but yeah, so this, it, you know, it is intended as a, you know, as a, a good humored, not a bitter thing, but a good humored, uh, fresh look at, at Polly's Island. Um, so you, and you don't, you know, famously, this Southern uh, writer, William Faulkner, you know, contemporary loosely of Eudora Welty said, you know, had a character say, I don't hate the South, I don't hate the South, I don't, I don't, at the end of a, a big novel. Uh, but, but that's, I, I don't, what you're saying is, you don't hate Polly's Island, you don't hate Polly's Island, you don't, you don't, right? It's not, I think that, is that correct? You're not... Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think if we think about the South more broadly, like Faulkner was talking about, um, yeah, I mean, I, I definitely think I have a love-hate relationship with the South. And I, I think, like, I mean, at the risk of offending anyone, like, I think if you have a love-love re relationship with the South, then, like, either you don't know anything about history or something's seriously wrong with you, right? Because it's a place where there's so many great things about the South. Mm -hmm. I mean, the blues, jazz, bluegrass, the cuisine is amazing. Um, 
the literature. literature. I mean, yeah. Alan Gerganis, who's a pretty famous Southern writer, um, told me once that he thinks the South gets the triple crown in American literature because Faulkner is the best novelist in American history, Flannery O'Connor is the best short story writer mm -hmm. in American history, and Tennessee Williams is the best playwright in American history. Wow. So the, yeah, the triple crown, good. we could add you know, so many names to that. Yeah. Like, um, I mean, Toni Morrison, Cormac McCarthy, Natasha Trethewey, mm -hmm. like, I mean, the writing here, I'm prejudiced, but I think it's the best writing in the nation. Um, so you have all this good stuff, but also you have, you know, a history of slavery, most obviously, um, colonialism, Native American genocide and removal, the KKK, environmental destruction, um, women's rights taking much longer to attain here, trans rights, gay rights, on and on and on. And so you do have a sort of confluence of historical things that mm. are not unique to the South, but sometimes they are particularly concentrated in right. this region. Um, you know, it's like, <laughs> whenever I look into American history, you know, slavery, Native American genocide, I never walk away thinking like, well, that was better than I thought it was gonna be. It's always like, oh, American history is a horror show. Um, and it's way worse than I thought it was gonna be. And so, yeah, with that sort of in mind, you have in the South, I think, the most conflicted American region because you have so much good and so much bad. And a lot of the good comes out of the bad, right? Like, I mean, Faulkner has that great line in the Nobel Prize acceptance speech that he gave in 1952 where he says, the heart in conflict with itself is the only thing worth writing about. The heart in conflict with itself. Um, and I think the heart of the South always has been and continues to be in conflict with itself because you have so much good and so much bad happening simulta simultaneously. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and that, that drives, it's driven so much Southern literature and because it's driven so much of Southern culture and history, yeah, absolutely. And I would agree, I would agree with the triple, triple crown. I hadn't heard <laughs> that before. And um, so, and Southern literature is, you know, is, is at the top of the list. Uh, and you, you've certainly added to, uh, to it as a scholar and now you're, you're getting in there as a writer as well. Um, what, what was your main challenge in writing this? Um, I think my main challenge is that I don't have an MFA, but I was trained as a literary critic and not a writer. Mm -hmm. So I think I wrote a novel with the brain of a literary critic and not the brain of a writer. Um, you know, I was like so like fixated on like, okay, I gotta get this Melville idea in here. I've gotta get this like obscure quote from Jack London's autobiography that no one's ever read, mm -hmm. Jack Barleycorn, like I've gotta get that um, in the book somehow. And so I was like, I think too fixated on that. And, and luckily like a lot of that got taken out of the book, but um, yeah, even just the form. So I was like insistent on I'm obsessed with Walt Whitman, so this book needs to have 52 sections that are in conversation with Song of Myself. Um, and so I had a couple of buddies, um, Mark Powell and Caleb Johnson, who are both amazing yeah. Southern writers. They both read it early on. And, um, and they're, I, both of them reacted in the same way. They were both like, this is the funniest thing I've ever read why are you writing it in this weird way? <laughs> um, and they really were like, and he had very good advice that I didn't take, which was like, like scrap the short chapters. Um, they were like, create a frame narrator who's an adult, mm -hmm. who's looking back. I mean, this is like the quintessential model for most Southern coming, coming of age stories, like right. To Kill a Mockingbird. You yes. have the adult frame narrator who tells the childhood story. And so it's the adult brain that leads us through all the things mm -hmm. that happen in the child. Um, and I was just insistent on, I want you to squirm in an adolescent's brain for the whole time. I don't want you to have the relief of like, and then 50 year old, it, you know, yeah. Zach thought this about this situation. Um, so I wanted that moment. So, so in other words, like it was such a personal book that I think it, I wrote it in a way that was like, 
made it not commercial because mm -hmm. I wanted it to be weird. <laughs> and it those you know those chapters I didn't know about the Whitman connection, fifty two of them, but you know the fact that they are compressed and uh, pithy, quick hitting. Uh, you know that that is that seems more in in line with an adolescent, you know, it's kind of moving this way, that way, quick moment, momentary kind of uh, consciousness moving from, from, uh, from scene to scene quickly. It sort of, you know, it kind of fits with the, with the, the, uh, the subject matter. Yeah. And I mean, I had, I had like other writers who were like, you know, make it one summer. And mm. like, you know, so it's like, has this shorter time um, and then we see this like moment of transition, but I really wanted it to be like, I wanted it to be like snapshots yeah. of the maturation process of this kid. And I wanted it to be that whole period because I think that period, even though it is only like four years, there, it's such a tremendous change during that period. And I feel like a single summer, you would not be able to have that kind of like serious transition mm -hmm. from the child's brain to the adult brain. So I wanted to have these kind of like snapshots of yeah. the process along the way. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if that was that. I mean, so in other words, I think I got good advice that I, some that I did take in toning down some of the references and things, some that I didn't take in terms of form um, that, yeah, it remains a little bit less commercial and a little bit more experimental than mm -hmm. I think a big New York press would want for sure. Yeah, but it still still works, you know, still works for what it is, and that's that's okay. Uh, that's yeah, you kind of stuck to stuck to your your uh, your technique, which is kind of what makes it uh, makes it yours on that level. Um, and so, uh, how would you describe your your writing process in putting this together? How did you? Did you have a process? Um, I mean, like I said, like the COVID kind of was a blessing in this way and giving me time to work on this project and other projects. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, my real job <laughs> is not writing. So I, yeah. I mean, I basically write whenever I find little bursts of time. Um, yeah, like my wife is in Ireland for f five weeks and um, I miss her, but I'm also like, this is awesome because I can work more <laughs> now. Steadily. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, in terms of the process, just, yeah. I mean, I don't really believe in writer's block. I think like, like Harry Cruz had this great line where he was like, writer's block doesn't, go, doesn't exist. Like, go sit in a room for eight hours and like, don't have the internet, don't answer your phone, and like, something's going to come out. Yeah. <laughs> like, you're not just going to sit mute and... Um, unthinking for yeah. eight hours. So I forced myself to leave the house and go sit somewhere else with n no distractions. I can't handle eight hours, but I can handle three to four right. a day. Yeah, and, and just write. And just you know, write, Just yeah. do it, write it, and sometimes it, it's not, not necessarily all golden. Yeah. You no. gotta polish it up afterwards. But yeah. Just get something out there that's something to work with. Yeah. So, yeah, that's pretty good writing advice. Don't don't uh, don't believe in writer's block. Just I have two. I have two it. computers. I have like an ancient laptop that the internet won't work on anymore, but it still works for Microsoft Word. Um, so the, yeah. And so I go with that. And so I literally can't yeah. check Very email. Good. Yeah, it's like a typewriter. Yeah, it's like the old school. <laughs> yeah, uh, typewriter. Yeah, good. So that keeps you focused, and and so what what are you what's your next uh, writing project after this? Um, I have a nonfiction book coming out, creative nonfiction, so like long form journalism, um, coming out next year with UNC Press. That's all about environmental issues, um, and then yeah, I'm like deep into a sequel to this one um, right. right now, which is. Um, leaving me behind, <laughs> it's not at all uh, true, which is actually very liberating um, to be able to just fully write a fictional character. Um, so it's somewhat related to this one. It takes um, 
the boy Josh's love interest. Um, and it sort of fast forwards to their senior year, and mm -hmm. it follows her in her senior year. Um, and so, yeah, it's been really fun to write. Um, it's about mermaid shows. If you know, like, um, Wiki Wachi was the really famous one in Florida, mermaid shows, where you, know, you go to this underwater auditorium and you see yeah. people do these underwater ballets while dressed as mermaids. Ben, uh, it, Ripley's uh, Aquarium up in Myrtle Beach oh, okay. features those regularly if anybody It's no now been, like a, yeah, it's a, thing. it's a subcultural phenomenon. There's a four part doc documentary on Netflix called Mer People that is. Wow. Yeah. yeah um, I'm not aware of that. So that <laughs> this will be interesting. It's, it's worth a watch. Yeah. Um, okay. But yeah, so it's um, it is so it is like again not autobiographical at all, but it's set in Polly's and in Myrtle Beach. So I imagine that there's a mermaid show in Myrtle Beach. <laughs> oh yes. In 1999, it's Y2K. Yes. And everyone's sort of freaking out because they don't know is there going to be a computer bug <laughs> that like shuts down society, or is yeah. the second coming wow. happening, or both? Why too crazy? Yeah. Yes. So it's, yeah. So it's very very nice. it's very chaotic book but hopefully fun too that yeah that sounds like a lot of fun uh coming up so that and that's the character chloe who yeah. shows up who will get center stage in in the next one all right um okay well uh let's let's go ahead and turn it over for some some audience participation uh so any questions for for uh zach vernon uh, our return uh homeboy hero out there that you, you still play the cello? I don't. I when I moved, I got out of graduate school and moved to Massachusetts, and I got rid of like almost everything because I just didn't have anywhere to put it. Um, I have, I've got a new guitar, and I was yeah, I almost got, bought a drum kit last week because my wife is out of town, and so I thought it'd be a good time to to get it before she gets back <laughs> and stops it. Um, so, but no cello, no, I wish. I thought about it a lot lately, actually. I have tape for you playing cello. Really? Oh my God, I, I haven't thought of this in so long, but do you, remember the movie that you made? What was the car, the Galaxy? Uh, it was in the Jets. What was it? Uh, I'm sorry, what, was what, was, what was the car that you had? I had a Galaxy 500. Do you remember the movie that you made when I was playing cello in the back of the, is that what you're talking about? Okay. <laughs> Do you have, I, I want a copy of that if you have it. <laughs> he probably does. <laughs> he probably does. He, John has copies of all of our movies from high school. Um, whatever happened. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Other? Um, I was going to say if this is your story, but I think you said it was. Um, so you're kind of early before a lot of the growth, more recent growth in Paul's Island. Mm -hmm. So I was just wondering kind of like what brought you and your family here, and um, you were talking about like churches, if you want to say which church it was. I guess it doesn't really matter, but they were all these conservative, like Boston, you know, Presbyterian church. And then I saw somebody that maybe you were also from Oklahoma, so I don't know if they came back to Oklahoma. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think Polly's is probably a very different place now than when I was here. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think importantly, the book is set in the mid 90s when, I mean, when I was going through middle school and early high school. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I want to be careful to not make generalizations about what this place was like either then or especially now, because I really don't know what it's like now. And even then, like, I don't want to make generalizations because it's really just like my version <laughs> of what it looked like um, then. So yeah, it's probably like, I mean, I think adolescents today growing up here probably have a very different experience, um, both because the place is bigger, but also, I mean, I think the internet changes everything about you know, how we experience the world. And, you know, I grew up sandwiched in that. I think it's, I think my generation is like this fall through generation between 
Gen X and millennials, because we are certainly not millennials, but we're also not properly Gen X. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean, I think my particular version of this story is strange because it's, or not strange, but unique because it's like I had a fully analog childhood and then a fully digital adulthood, so I didn't have the internet at all. Growing up, which is, I think has both positive and negative repercussions. Like I think it's, um, uh, I think the internet enables kids today to look things up and realize that they're not alone. And I think that can be very positive. They can find a sense of community um, online and that can be very positive. There are also obviously lots of really negative things about um, the way the internet can impact kids' developments, not kids, but adolescents' development. Like we were talking about this earlier today with like, you know, the way that kids understand their sexuality is vastly different when you have access to the internet. Whereas like, the thing that I think is often funny in this book is like, just the fumbling attempts <laughs> that we made to like understand who we are. I mean, mm. both like basic things about anatomy and biology, but also like, you know, who we are in terms of gender and sexuality. Like we were just blindly and sometimes joyfully working through those processes ourselves. Yeah. Whereas I think when you have the internet, like all of a sudden you have the world at your fingertips and that can be really good, but it can also be bad in the sense that you don't have that process of growth and exploration that, yeah. that I think my generation had, right. my generation and previous generations yeah. had. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great insight. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't think it, I don't think that affected me as much as it affected, like, obviously, those people who were finishing high school and starting college in those years. And I think, yeah, I mean, I think we're still seeing all kinds of behavioral and maturity issues as a result of, you know, those kids that had to go through that, um, that world of Zoom when they should have been out in the real world experiencing things. Um, the other question in terms of race, um, I mean, it, it's not a book that tackles race really directly. I mean, I think there is obviously a lot of work that could be done here or anywhere else in the South or the US on race. Um, so that wasn't a major part of the book, although there are some African-American characters um, in the book that come up periodically, both in terms of the um, students and their classmates, but also um, you know, there are a few references to Sandy Island, which at least when I was growing up was predominantly African-American. I'm not sure what it's like now. It is still yeah. very much. There, although there, you know, there are sections that, are, that are, people have moved in on from the outside, but it's still, the core is still very much yeah. African-American and descendants of former enslaved people. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, 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 I had to teach the whole time. Um, yeah, and it was terrible. I mean, I, yeah, I really love teaching, um, but I really love teaching in person um, and having that kind of face-to-face -face interaction. Yeah, it was really key to the way I approached the classroom, and it was, yeah, it, yeah, I think I was a pretty bad <laughs> teacher during that period. Um, yeah, so, yeah, I did have to go through that, and it was not, not fun. I mean, I talk to my students about it a good bit, for sure. Um, it impacts the students that I deal with less, just because they're in college and they don't really have to, you know. I hope colleges aren't banning books. I mean, I guess maybe some of them are, but I mean, it seems like that's more of a um, elementary, high school, and 
public library sort of issue. So yeah, fingers crossed that we don't start banning books at public universities. Right. Yeah, I think planning is key. <laughs> like, this book was just anarchy, because um, it was just, I mean, fact and fiction, and I was writing it, you know, when I was busy doing lots of other things, and so, and again, I had like that academic brain and not writerly brain when I was approaching it, and now, for the next novel that I'm, I'm working on now, it's like, again, while, while Jess is out of town, <laughs> um, I stole from the university this giant whiteboard. Um, I mean, it's so big that it couldn't fit in the back of my truck. Um, it's like 15 feet across. And I have it set up in the living room. It takes up the entire length of the room. And I'm just like a madman, scribbling um, and trying to plot out the whole book. Um, so that's very different, because I know, I mean, I'm structuring it like a three-act structure. Um, and there are certain conventions that go into the three-act structure. And so, I mean, I have everything, I had everything, like, almost every scene planned before I started actually writing. So, and I think that's how, like, people tend to handle screenplays and film series, TV series, more, because um, it seems less romantic than the notion of like the individual writer, you know, sitting at home and drinking bourbon and <laughs> pounding out the first draft um, that just comes to them. But I have found it to be really helpful to like, I mean, I know, so that when I go and I force myself to sit down for four hours uninterrupted, it's like, okay, you just pick the scenes off of the, you know, plotted out board and then you know where, where you're going. I mean, there are unexpected things like, I mean, yeah, writing is always like, like you're schizophrenic and you have multiple people talking in your head all the time. And sometimes they say unexpected things, but for the most part, it's like I have a structure and a plan in a way that I didn't have for the first one. Is that kind of a good story? It's like um, you might be thinking about stopping and having a hard time continuing with the writing and whatnot. And being the sign come through that it actually can, you know, there's a great story about Quinn Mac McCarthy and he was having a real problem with one of his books and he's thinking about not continuing and going any further unless he had a really good sign. And he was at the time so bored that he couldn't even show the toothpaste. Mm. And that particular day he walked out to the mailbox and he threw a sample of toothpaste. <laughs> got home from dinner with my parents. Um, I was staying at the Litchfield Inn. Uh, and I sat outside on the beach for a minute, and there was this storm just unexpectedly came rolling through. And I just like, in, um, in an instant, knew how the second book ends um, after seeing this image of the storm and sort of thinking about, I was thinking about what a weird experience it is. Not weird, but different experience it is to live here with big skies. Like I live in Appalachia now, and I'm so hemmed in by the mountains that I never see a big sky anymore, right? Mm -hmm. I only see, I mean, I see the mountains and they're beautiful, um, but the metaphor of being able to see a storm coming versus not being able to see it coming in Appalachia. I thought it was really interesting last night, and I was like, oh, okay, that's, that's the end of the next book. So, yeah, I think sometimes it does happen that way, where it's, you aren't sure where it's going, but it ends, ends up hopefully working out. Did you have a question? Yes, yeah. Um, the thing I think I tend to struggle with most is in, in writing fiction is characters. Um, now, a lot of times you use characters Writer will use characters to you know, explore different elements of the theme, um, competing with world views, things like that. How do you approach writing individual characters? Do you use them?
them as, as elements of theme, or do you just try to make people and then find a way to get that? Yeah. I mean, I think both. Um, I mean, there are certainly characters that you want to sort of get across certain kinds of ideas or themes, but I think if they're going to be believable, they need to be living, breathing characters first. And so, yeah, I tend to think plot, character, and then the themes kind of maybe last, work, they work themselves out. Yeah. Mm. But I think, yeah, creating characters is, it's the most difficult plot, or at least I find it the most difficult. Like, the, you know, to, to plot out a novel is relatively easy, and also like relatively formulaic when you get down to it, but characters I feel like are, it's much more difficult to create an interesting, believable character. Mm. Yeah. I think the best advice is just like, you have to put them in as many awkward, terrible situations as possible. Like, do to your characters things that you don't ever want to have happen to yourself. And then it ends up being interesting. Mm. Have you struggled with feeling judged by your peers shifting from scholarly work to now creative work? I, I know Good in question. my life, I still have some of my professors <laughs> in my head, my design professors. So I never really struggled that much with peers once I got out on my own and got away from them. I don't have a single self, so I have to do much of my <laughs> I just wondered if you, if you struggled with that at all in making the shift. Or you just know that they're all jealous of where you are. <laughs> no, I mean, no, I definitely think that there's something like academics oh, yeah. are supposed to do academic work mm -hmm. and not do creative work. And there's like, there's a lot of gatekeeping and a lot of turfiness with yeah. creative writers. And like, when you try to cross over, I feel like there's some. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't feel like academics care as much if they lose you, but if you try to go into the creative writing community, I feel like the creative writers sometimes are like, you don't belong here. Um, yeah, yeah, I feel that pretty acutely where, yeah, yes. they police those boundaries. For sure, yeah. I, I, as I've, I've, I've worked in, poetry was my main, as an academic, I analyzed poetry as a literary critic of poetry, and you know, publish, have moved into kind of writing poetry and publishing that. Now, you know, I've felt some some blowback, pushback from that. That that, you know, it's all all good and well when you're writing about poetry, but when you're writing poetry, it's that they, they don't they're not very generous in including you in. So, I think there's you know it's it's a it's a crowded field, creative writing. So there's a lot of jockeying for position there. So I imagine. You know, there's there's a lot of that. Uh, people they don't want to just open up the gates wide, no matter how talented somebody is coming in, or maybe especially how talented somebody might be coming in. They you know, kind of want to limit the limit the competition. Mm -hmm. um, Yeah, I did my master's thesis on him. Um, so I ended up interviewing him several times for that. And then, um, yeah, I've kind of just gotten to know him along and along. Um, and he's, I mean, despite being one of the most famous writers in America and a New York Times bestseller, um, he's a very nice, approachable guy. So, I mean, he certainly did not have to blurb my book, but was nice enough to do it. Um, yeah. So uh, yeah. So as much as writers can sometimes be gatekeepy, like sometimes they can be really kind and generous yeah. too. And Ron Rush is so good and so He's... incredibly famous that he, I'm not a threat to him. <laughs> that that is true too. And sometimes at the top, like Ron Rash, I I've, I've found that the writers who I I consider at the very top are sometimes the most humble. They they paid their dues to get there sometimes on a number of levels, and they, are, they tend to be incredibly generous. And Ron Rash is certainly, he's a wonderful guy and very, very generous uh, when he, he really doesn't have to be at all. And, so, and, and Zach is 
uh, one, one of the top critics, uh, you know, scholars on Ron Rash's work too. So it's, uh, you know, it makes sense that that relationship and that connection. Um, yeah. Any, any, how about one, one final question if anybody has anything else for Zach? These are all very good. One of the things that you really like that intrigued me, believe it or not, was your shotgun thing. <laughs> and I just keep waiting for you to buy the shotgun. I was surprised about the drum set. Hmm. But I, I keep looking for that day when you say, got the shotgun back. That was also like, I sold it before moving to Massachusetts because I didn't. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Um, well, I've recently come into two different guns that have been <laughs> given to me. I don't know if either of them work, um, but my great-grandfather's gun that I got after um, Uncle Keith died, um, which is this amazing like 110, 120-year-old single shot, his squirrel gun. Um, I would never use it because it's so old and so special. Um, but then we also were just gifted Jess's father's 1970s Beretta handgun. It's like one of those really tiny 22s that James Bond, like 1970s era James Bond carried. I would also never use that because um, it's also very special and um, very old. But yeah, weirdly went from no guns to two guns in just a, a year. Two guns, yeah. neither of which work. So the best do, I could do would be to scare someone off <laughs> with one of them. You, you have you farmer in that, right? You, I mean, you have a big garden. Garden, yeah, a big garden. and chickens and yeah, yeah, chickens. So you do in Appalachian. You run in kind of a a mini mountain farm up there too. Yeah, might need the guns to run off some varmints. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there were yeah, we had a massive chicken massacre all winter. Um, where raccoons were yeah. getting into the chicken coop and killing the chickens every night. And mm. so that was the last time that I was like, OK, I have to get a gun and def defend the homestead. Um, but yeah, the gardening, and I worked on a farm for, I had a sabbatical from the university and worked on a farm for six months. And that's the topic of the nonfiction book that's oh, coming out next awesome. year. Wow. Well. We we may, well, Zach has had a long day, did a great job at the Movable Feast. Uh, so we'll, we'll let him off the hook there, but we might, we might have you back to talk about that. That sounds great. Uh, you can return home again with another book. Uh, so you just keep writing more and more books. The, uh, Zach will, if you haven't gotten a copy yet of Our Bodies Electric, he is more than happy. Uh, we'll sell you one, 20 bucks, and he'll personalize it for you, sign it for you. But let's give one more round of applause for Zachary Vernon today. Thank you all for being here. Thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it.